Um, so a couple of questions. Mm. Um, how, this is only because I'm curious, what, has there been like a standout, like maybe like message you've received or a, a reach out from someone that's doesn't know you, but it's got you on socials. Mm. That's firstly, has anyone reached out to you? I'm sure they have, but like, do, do any of those like stand out to you? Um, there's hundreds of, to thousands of people have reached out to me and it's honestly someone saying like, I hope you're well from, you know, Joe Blog somewhere means just as much as someone who's famous. Honestly, it does. Because if you speak to someone who's famous, well known, they're like, well, my opinion doesn't matter more than his. That's the same reason when people ask me for my opinion on political topics, I'm like, why does mine matter more than you? Why is this Instagramming tell Instagram are telling me this bullshit? Like, I'm not a politician. <laughs> like, my word shouldn't mean any more than anyone else's, no matter how many followers you've bloody got, like a tangible thing. Um, the two big ones, though, that people will know the names. Um, Mark Donaldson, the Victoria Cross recipient, he was one of the very early on ones to me, and he has been, and still is, although I wouldn't tell him this, an absolute hero of mine. Now that he's become a close mate of mine, I don't want to get in a big head, but um, Dono's a fucking legend. Um, his reach out initially meant so much. And from someone who his credentials in the military and public life is so high to just be, hey, Willie, how you going? And still texts me, shit like that. I remember I got discharged from hospital and the first person to call me was Donna. If ever, even before my parents and stuff, like he saw like an Instagram photo that I was finally home from, I was in ICU due to chemo. Um, I got really sick from the chemo, I ended up in ICU. First bloke called me, it was him. I was just driving home, really. I saw your thing, I just wanted to make sure you're going alright. And I'm like, this fucking guy, he's a Victoria Cross recipient, he's probably got everything going on under the sun. Um, you know, he's got kids at home, he's got everything, and yet he's reaching out to me. I'm like, what a fucking legend. Um, and the other one, very similarly to that, is Hamish Blake, like Hamish and Andy Hamish. Um, this was when I was a very small Instagrammer, if you'll say that. I hate that word. Um, his social influence is worse, though. Um, <laughs> hey, wankers. Um, but Hamish Blake, I get a message one day of Hamish Blake, like, blue tick on Instagram. I'm like, what the fuck? And it's a video. Um, and it's like, hey, Willie, you're a massive information man. I hope you're well. Um, I even got a photo of you on my wall, like a painting of you on my wall. I'm like, what? And he turns the camera, and it's like one of those, like, bathroom paintings of, like, naked women in Rome. <laughs> he's like, oh, shit, no, that's not you, wrong one. And then he's like, hey, man, and then it sort of came out of, like, in a bit of comedy, but, hey, bro, I hope you're really well. Um, if you need anything, reach out, whatever. And again, I'm like, this guy has so much shit going on that he's still reached out. And now a lot of that's a lot of people reach out, and that's then like you know famous people, you make a wish sort of celebrities. But like Hamish, like this is my this is my personal phone number. Let me know, blah blah blah. When you're in Melbourne next, we're gonna be. Uh, and I'm like, oh hey, right, you know, I, everyone says that shit. It's like when you're here next, we'll grab a bit. Next thing I'm in um, like Richmond in Melbourne. Um, oh Will, I saw you in Melbourne. Text me, and I text. Yeah, yeah, I'll be down this pub like half an hour. Come down and just sit with me for like two hours and just talk shit. We didn't talk anything about, like, me or him. It was just shit talk. And it's like, fuck, these are such, like, good just dudes. Like, you put them on such a pedestal, but they're just, like, you and me. They're just I mean, they're falling into, you know, maybe being a celebrity public figure, whatever you want to say. But they're just really good, solid guys who care about people and really people I look up to. Oh, shit, maybe, maybe this young lad... In, in some way, I'm not trying to compare myself to them, but sees me like this to them. But sees me, oh, Willie, you know, he's, he's a well-known whatever. And I try, try and give back where I can because I'm like, fuck, maybe this really does mean someone, something to someone. Maybe me just thanking them for having my support, maybe that mean, maybe that's something they fucking need. Um, just a little thing. You know, little things like that make such a difference. I remember when I was first diagnosed, a guy... A, a friend in the army, but not very close. We were never very close. Nothing against, nothing against each other. We just weren't close. Um, pretty much just in passing, goes, oh, Willie, you'll be right. You're the most fucking optimistic bloke that I know. And that was it. That was the whole conversation. And that was fucking what I needed at that time. That was like, 
night and day. That was like, holy fuck, yeah, I can get through this. Um, and that was years ago, and that stuck with me since so much. The funny thing was, he separated from defence only a couple of weeks back, and I saw him, and I was like, hey, man, like, I just, you don't even know this, but you said to me when I was first diagnosed, that you're the, like, will you be right? You're the most optimistic bloke that I know. And he said, yeah, and you still are, you fucking prick, <laughs> and left. And I'm like, that still means so much to me. He didn't really grasp how what influence that had on me. It was, it was massive, and I try and give back that if I if I can anyway. And sort of don't let the stone go unturned because if you think oh, I should say that to someone, even if you think ah oh, they, they don't really need it or whatever, that can just be such a massive thing for them, you know? Yeah. Um, so I guess <laughs> better to say. The, the, the stuff that people say to you and mm. write to you and like it has, has that helped through this journey? Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah, massively. You know, you know people are on your side in this. Um, you know, it, it's... I almost wish they'd send it to more people but me. I sort of feel like, well, I'm, you know, I don't really... I'm not really deserving of this. Send it to other people who are struggling. Um, but, of course, yeah, it helps so much. Um, just the, that ongoing support's insane. And what do you like? What do you want people to like? You've got a purpose. You've got a mission. You've got something that's mm. bigger than you. What What do you What do you really want people that are watching your journey to to take away? Like, mm. obviously, there's the fundraising and and you know mm. contributing to research and stuff like that. But at, on a personal level, like, what influence? Do you ideally want to have over people that see your content? Um, I really just want people to be like authentic and just do what makes them happy and not try and sort of be anyone else um, and have fun with it. Stuff around, make jokes, don't be too, don't be too um, sort of serious about yourself. Just don't take yourself too space seriously. Like, fucking hell. There's so many people so serious about shit. Like, you just don't fucking need to be. You know, people get offended and I lose followers and shit over um, jokes and stuff. And I'm like, oh, that's all right. But, and I don't care if people really unfollow me or not. Um, and if I annoy someone, good. You've made the decision that I don't need this guy in my life. And that's probably a good thing. Um, stuff like, you know, I said that all, like, Put up a post once after I saw a doctor and I was like, yeah, you know, this is what happened, this is what he said. And I said, um, it's really made me realise that all artists become famous once they die. So I'm going to release like 10 drawings of just dicks that I'll sign and once I die, I'll, I'll just give them out to you guys and once I die, hopefully they're worth a fuckload, you can buy a Lambo or something. Um, just a you know, dick drawing drawn by Willie, uh, like one of 10, um, to try and fucking make some followers fucking some money. And you know, it's still gonna, it, it's going to happen. It's something that would be funny as fuck. Um, you know, just don't take yourself too seriously. And have a joke and then do stuff while you have the ability to do it. That's probably the main one as far as, you know, oh, I don't, shit, I haven't posted in like two. I'm a terrible Instagram. I'm fucking shit. But doing stuff while you can. Because a lot of mine, you know, my future is pretty, you know, pretty, um, pretty foggy, you know, with... Not only the whole death thing people focus on, but you know, mo losing you know neurocognitive neurocognitive functions, um, all that sort of stuff. This is why we have very few um, sort of spokesmen for brain cancer. Is not many people actually have the ability to do it, um, or the health to do it. So we, we don't have many. Um, so you know, doing stuff while you can. And I just want people to look at me and think, fuck. Well, he's doing this while he can. Well, he's travelling, doing this. And we spoke, I think, offline about this, that with my travelling, I'm like, people, a lot of them, yeah, I'll travel when I'm 30 and I've got a bit more money. And I see time and time again, people never fucking do it. They get 30 having kids and buying a house and it might not ever happen. And especially travelling is just an analogy for it. But, like, do it while you can. You know, you're young, travelling's not expensive. It is for what you get, maybe, but it's... Most young Australians can afford it. Um, and I guarantee it, it's worth it. Hostels are cheap. Flights are, you know, well, they're cheap now due to COVID, so get over now. 
um, and have a good time, make mistakes, fuck up, you know, have sex in weird places, do fucking weird shit, and it's just all fucking experience, it's all learning, like, people are so fucking hung up on it, you're like, no, you're never going to be that Instagrammer with that perfect ass and shit in Mykonos, go to Mykonos, go on a Contiki, you get fucking shit faced with a bunch of 20 Australians, do that thing where you have a shot, you hit on the head with a bloody baseball bat with a helmet on, fucking awesome, <laughs> you don't need to be, you know, we're, we're, everyone's almost strung up on being this perfect, like, social media life, fuck that, just do your thing, um, have fun with it, it's serious when you need, but it's not, it's fucking social media, <laughs> a lot of people will be, I've had a guy message me today, because he wrote to me, he's like, oh, I hate when these people do this, if someone like, you're stealing my personality, and I wrote back, I'm like, yeah, these people are fuckheads, and he's like, I can't believe you swear so much for a side of the water of Australia. I'm like, well, I, I, I write on here how I speak in real life, so you're going you're gonna to cop it. <laughs> like, oh, that's piss funny. <laughs> so, okay. So that's, that's an appreciation that diagnosis has g- mm. given you or maybe highlighted for you. Very much so. Like you got, whatever time you got, mm. use it. We all have it. We all have that that ticking time bomb. Mm. If I didn't have an MRI, I wouldn't know about this. I was diagnosed due to an imbalance in my shoulders that my body armour caused me headaches from. So all it was. I spent close enough to nine months in a armoured vehicle in Afghanistan in body armour, like fucking me, um, leaning over a gun fucking thing, um, and I had torn the traps in my back, just like well, over the length of time my traps had minor tears in them. Uh, causing me headaches. I went and got dry needling and my fucking headaches went, but I got an MRI and I have this tumour. I'm not trying to scare people into saying that, oh, you've got a fucking brain tumour, but my chances are you fucking don't. But what if you're in that 0.001% that do? You don't know. You know, go out and do shit. Um, of course, be still within reason of it, but if there's something you really want to do, I hate, and I don't have a bucket list. People... I need a buck list. I think that's bullshit. Go and fucking do. My first, very first psycho, um, psychologist appointment when I was really struggling with my diagnosis, he was like, tell me about yourself. And I started, you know, I joined the army and I went to the Middle East. And I did all this scuba diving, and did this skydiving and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, so you've gone out and just done shit you wanted to do? I'm like, yeah. Okay. Skydiving's fucking expensive. So I went and paid him a couple hundred bucks and did some jumps. Yeah, he said, you know, and this is what this is what changed my whole mindset on my fundraising. Simply, you're not you're not a bucket list guy at all. He said because oh, those bucket list items come and then they're filled within a couple of weeks. Even post time, they're filled. He said you're a mean guy. You need meaning in your life. You need purpose. You need something to be driving for something bigger. The purpose for me before this was always special forces selection or special forces. Always it was everything. Um, it, it was everything. Uh, from the moment I woke up to when I was trying to fall asleep, that's what I was thinking. Training for that, doing that, everything. Um, and when my diagnosis came and that went out the window, I had no purpose, no, no, no reason to go to the gym. I didn't enjoy going to the gym, I did it because I wanted to train for that. Um, I wasn't enjoying the army at the time, I did it because I wanted to train for that. It, was every, it became my whole life. And it's important to have things like that too. Uh, maybe not as in depth as that, you know, you can still have an option B, but it became everything. Um, bucket lists weren't my thing. I got diagnosed and then I refound my purpose then in um, in fundraising and telling my story, more telling my story than fundraising. Fundraising is an easy, people pull out fundraising, I do too, because you can put a number figure on it, it's $100,000, it's this. It's easy to do. You can't put a number figure on telling your story or the people you've influenced. You can't do it, and I think, but that is still a lot more valuable. I think the v- most valuable work I've done is unseen in private inboxes to particularly young men. I think that is by far the most valuable work I've, I've done in my whole life, and, and I, I still think the most valuable. Um, I still think the most valuable work I'll do in my entire life is with those particularly young men private messages who we will never know what problem to do. Well, I don't know my fucking head from the shit photo, but that's it. And that's that's maybe all it needed to be, but maybe that's all they needed to. And I get a lot out of that as well. 
Um, that's that's the value. And this is I sort of tried to portray to Scott Morris, the Prime Minister, on the phone. Was uh, I know they say for brain cancer awareness on my medal and for money and whatever, but the value, the most valuable work I've done, no one wants to see. Um, that's heck, my can't go through million boxes. Um, don't do that. You'll see some shit. You don't want it. Um, but yeah, it's um, that's where it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm a Tinder. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> so you got some plans? I, yeah. I look like I'm on camera. Like <laughs> I'm gonna sit like this. Like yeah, I'm not even right. on camera. What's yeah. um? You got some plans? So tell me yeah. what's on the card. Um, so I think same as my card, same as everyone else's. That COVID has just thrown a massive bloody spanner in the works and just go oh, fuck you. Um, but um, look. I am separating from the Defence Force. And that's not something that I you know, wanted to do, but it's at the time, it's, it's time for me to separate. You know, my illness has sadly really come across that my progression in the job I want um, really has come to a halt. Uh, and, you know, that, that's, that is heartbreaking for me. You know, Defence Force is everything I wanted to do. And I've been offered positions otherwise, but really, if, I'm, if I'm not in the infantry, I don't. It's, that's where my passion was. I do a half life job. So once I do separate, um, hopefully the borders are open, but if fingers crossed, uh, then I'll be back into travel. Um, and I want to, I just want to experience shit. People will be like, well, where do you want to go? I don't really care. I just want to experience stuff. I want to experience good or bad and hot and cold and, and just stuff. The best trip I ever did was when I just flew to Helsinki in the middle of Finland, the capital of Finland, just flew there, met a friend. Um, who lives there, and we just did stuff, and it wasn't, you know, anything grand, it wasn't, but it was, we went to the local bar and with Finnish people and just drank this and went to a house party and then ended up somewhere, and that just experiences of stuff, that's, you know, my life expectancy is a lot less than most people, um, which is a good thing for most people, maybe not for me, um, but just, I just want to experience like almost a lifetime worth of shit in however long I can do it. Um, the flip side of this is funding. I don't know how, the, how I'm going to fund it, um, but that'll be right. right. I've got some savings. <laughs> I'll end up, I'll end up, hopefully um, I can end up saving some money somewhere. So the whole, what will eventually happen on my socials is a post will go up to my you know, 20,000 ish people and be like, hey, who wants to have Willie on a couch? <laughs> and I don't care where you are, I'm coming to visit. Um, you know, and a couple of reasons. One, it's cheap traveling. Uh, but it's also I'd love to really meet and uh, experience with people who have supported me. Like, holy shit. Uh, like, you know, these people might just be a name on a screen, but they're a person with their life and problems and goals and pub they go to and everything. Um, and I actually want to experience that. Um, so, yeah, I can't wait for that to all happen. You know, it's, a, it, it's still a few months off with everything and COVID's fucked everything. Um, but this gives me time to plan and whatever and then yeah and I want to share that those experiences as well with people so you know I've uh, invested a fair bit of money into you know um, video gear and camera gear and everything so I can like record it and sort of share it a lot um, and whether people watch it or not it's up to them but um, at least will be there and be something for me to look back on too I one of my biggest regrets in life is not and I am and, and I'm good at it but not taking enough photos or videos of things like I've always travelled with my like big camera, like a DSLR, you know, professional type camera. And even though I've never taken enough photos, and I'm like, fuck. Like, the ability for us to take photos now is so easy and cheap. Like, yes, you can go on Canon's website and buy a $10,000 camera, but even if it's just on your phone or just on a little point and shoot or something, like, keep those memories, because there's so much shit that I'm like, I wish I, especially with my memory not being what it was at all, um, I wish I had better memory of those and photos really rejog your memory on it. But yeah, traveling's next and just experiencing and I want to experience bad too of fuck I'm lost in the middle of Finland. <laughs> like it's minus forty, this is fucked. Um that stuff too, and I want to really share that with people and take people on a bit of a journey with myself. Sounds good, man. You take me along. <laughs> It'd be wicked. Mate, if I'm if I had the money I'd bring you along to video. <laughs> I've talking about this before. I'm like, fuck, I wish I could just be like, here you go, here's your ticket, and you can do whatever. I just just video me occasionally and then just 
Just keep it rolling and just put it up. So if, if you've been terrible at taking photos, um, are you going to do a better job this time when I, you start traveling? I, bloody hell, I hope so. Um, look, that said, I've got some really good ones that like, really mean a lot to me that I would never share because it, I wouldn't I mean never share, but it's like there's nothing worth shareable about it. It's just like me pissed in a pub, but I'm like, oh, but those people, were, like, we did this, like, we all went and did this. Like, no idea who those people are, but that was fucking wicked fun. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, like, um, it doesn't need to be anything grand. I just, yeah, but yeah, taking those photos and videos for memories is something we're so accessible to and we take a lot of bullshit and not good stuff. We take a lot of photos of our food or me cleaning my car, but not... Like, yeah, you're guilty of that. Come on, guys, everyone come in. We're setting up the tripod. I can stand in front. And it used to be like a cringy thing, but like grandpa did it. Like set up the tripod, timer's on, fucking everyone gather in. And now it's almost like we're so used to taking bullshit photos that we don't bother doing that. And it's like, that's still like, I look back on some of those like cringy as family photos with people that now aren't alive. It's like, fuck, that means so much to me. At the time, fuck, I did not want to do it. <laughs> It's an it's an important thing that I've sort of learnt to should I need to do that. What's the um what's the the can you pinpoint what it is that's pulling you towards travel? I think it's the sense of sort of freedom uh, and and sort of um, experience and sort of all of that. Um, and I think it's as we we spoke about previously we went over being sort of. Um, so in depth in a in a moment and that that moment is just blissful there's no other external um worries or pressures or anything you're just present in that moment and i think traveling especially by yourself is you can find yourself in that a lot um that's something really drawing me towards it um that i've got somewhere to stay and i've got this and i'm good to go we'll just do it how it comes it's just an adventure I think I'm, I'm just yearning for an adventure. You know, the last time I was, I took proper leave from work and travelled was um, straight after I was in Afghanistan, and I've had all my tumour stuff since. I haven't really had much of a release at all. It's been years. I haven't been home to my hometown in well since 2017, so three and a bit years now. What's your hometown? Uh, Warrnambool in Victoria. I just haven't been, been back. Yeah, it's um, haven't been haven't been there since the end of Afghan. Um, it just just hasn't, and that's like stuff like that. I'm just like I just want to get out and travel. You know, I have a lot. I have a lot of external stresses that that don't upset me, but it's just you know, I have this constant appreciation of time with a diagnosis like mine. Like we're all going to die, but I think with what I've had, I've become so much almost in the face of mortality that it's a constant reminder of time, just all the time. It's it's and could it could honestly drive you fucking crazy. Um, if you couldn't sort of learn to just, well, that's just a thing. Um, and that's all it is. It's just a thing. We all have that clock running too. Um, but, you know, I think just that escaping for a bit would be nice. Um, I spoke actually to my psychiatrist about this last time that, you know, I am a pretty confident person and out there and whatever. Um, but being so in the public eye with, my social and everything too, actually does put a lot of stress on me. That, well, I'm sort of needing to act in this way. And especially now with, you know, and the psychological, with my recognitions of, you know, being inducted into the Order of Australia um, and things like that, it almost creates a you need to act like this way. And even if that is how I'd normally act anyway, it almost adds that le level of pressure on top. Um, maybe I just want to go somewhere where no one knows me and get pissed in a bar with other people staying at a hostel and no one knows my condition, no one knows shit. It just, that's it. I normally don't tell people when I meet them at first at all about my condition or my socials or anything. Um, I'm just me and we're just having a beer or whatever it happens. I, when I cross the Simpson, uh, double crossing the Simpson Desert for a veterans thing and I jump in this car with this bloke as a support me, um, using my experience as a crew commander. Um, and he didn't know till like day seven. We're in the vehicles together for like 18 hours a day. And he didn't know about my diagnosis. And he was stunned. He's like, what the fuck? Like, how did you, how is that not the first thing that came out of your mouth? 
Um, he said, I know everything else about you. I know all your sex stories and shit. And it wasn't until it wasn't until they asked you in a pub um, to get up and speak about resilience, and you started with all these sex stories and all this bullshit, and then got to the truth. And he's like, what the fuck? How's this guy just been sitting next to me in the car for you know now like 80 hours total, and this just hasn't come up? Like because it's not my whole definition of everything. Like it's not just me. Like it's not oh that's really with the with the tumor. It's well, I'm, on me aside, like, that's just something else that happens. Even if I'm best known for that, but it's just another thing. And what's um is that I fucked it. Because it's hilarious. Um how do you navigate that? As in what you what you've created this point of the social media presence and yeah you're right, like people I mean I mean your, your name on social says it all, doesn't mm. it? Yeah. So how how do you navigate how much you like allow that identifier into your life? I think maybe it's not um the identification, but it's being true on socials to the person people meet. Because um, I've had people meet me in real life, like, holy fuck. The only thing different is you swear a lot more in real life than, than on socials. And I want it to be like that. It's, I don't want it to be this, you know, this person's just, you know, whatever on socials, and then you meet them, and it's completely like different. I just try and be as honest as I can. And I think that negates it a bit too, that, you know, not everything I post is, a, is related to my my tumor, that, well, I'm just out having a beer. <laughs> and that, that's just as important. Um, and that's why it's always been open for other people to come and, you know, um, chat to me and everything. It's because I'm not, it's nothing special. It's just people go through this every day. Um, and maybe the name was a bad choice, but definitely makes people have a look at it. But um, who's this bloody bloke? Um, it's just, it's one of those things you just got to stay true to what you do. And who you are, like I've turned back so much stuff from people because like, that's just not me. Like a, a lot of it's like money sponsorship stuff. And like, that's just fuck off. <laughs> like, like I'd have a I'd have a buyout price. Everyone would if you if you threw if you threw a couple of zeros at me somewhere over there. Fuck it, I'll I'll push that. Um, and no one will blame me too. Um, but it's just staying true through yourself and taking the piss. And that's about it. The I'm to laugh with you. <laughs> no, that's all right. Who's the best song you've done? Selling a car. Um, I've got two cars at the moment, and one of them I think about selling every fucking day because it's a pain in the ass. That's my four wheel drive. Uh, but I do love it. Uh, I think creating, having something that is, you know, just you know, bought and then making it your own is so important. Um, and with, so the car most people know from what's my Subaru. And then there's the little Suzuki, which is a shit box in all regards. But if, if money wasn't a factor with selling cars, I would, if I became a millionaire tomorrow, I would happily let the Subaru go uh, and keep the Suzuki. Uh, and it wouldn't matter if I was Elon Musk, I'd keep that car. Because my Subaru I could rebuild. With money I could Walk in and I like this part and that and turbo and blah blah blah. It would be there. It would be, you know, it's a very, you know, it's a not nice car to drive. Power steering this stuff. But it's nowhere near as quirky as this Suzuki. Like, my Suzuki is such a shit box. Money couldn't buy the quirkiness is about it. Like, yeah, you gotta get first gear in like this. And then you gotta, you know, you can push start it yourself with one foot out the door because it's so light. Because um, it's just a, it's just a, bits of everything car like the engine's not original the gearbox isn't original nothing is um dad welded up all the roll bar for me and the, the bull bar and everything uh and it's such just a unique thing of so many people's expressions into it including my own um that car i could never sell i could sell i could sell the subaru um you know if i had more money than i couldn't bloody afford to sell it now but if i ran into if someone wants to pay me a million bucks to do this and well, I'd sell it and buy a new one, whatever. Like I love it. It's it's you know a daily car. It's fantastic. I love it. Um, and it's uniquely mine. 
but not to the same extent that Suzuki's uniquely mine. That it's, it's a bit of a laugh and it's, it's the shitness that makes it good. Same with a lot of stuff. A lot of, a lot of people don't appreciate the shitness in things. There's a saying in the army um, that a good day is a good day, a bad day is a good story. And that is the most, if you ever join, anyone who ever joins Defence Force would be like, this is fucked on the day. And then in five years old, bang, that was the best day because that sucked so bad. And now we all talk about that. Um, a lot of people say you remember the good times. In the army, you remember the bad times with your best mates or the bad times with your good mates. Um, and they, they are the good times and the good memories. Uh, and same with my travelling and stuff. I'm like, fuck, that sucked. Like the biggest thing I remember of Finland was night one, I'd landed. It was like 45 degrees in Adelaide, flew into Finland, landed, and this girl was like, yeah, we're going to go do this thing where they cut a hole in the ice and you go from a sauna at like 60 degrees and then go jump straight in the ice water. And, you know, ice in water means it freezes below zero. So it was the water was actually below zero but not frozen because it's got the salt, uh, sorry, the salt in it, salt water. Um, yeah, the salt water, yeah, um, stops from freezing the salt in it. Um, and I'm like, yeah, this is weird. I'm, I'm like straight out, of, straight out of Afghan. I've got what we refer to as Afghanitude, which is, you know, that attitude you get coming out of Afghanistan. You think you're fucking, you know, 10 foot tall and shredded. Um, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, next thing I'm just, I, I jump in and I've just got hooks for hair. I'm, I thought I was fucking dying. Um, I don't suggest doing it to anyone. Like most people with like skydiving or bungee jumping, like, that was amazing. I wouldn't do it again, but I suggest anyone to do it one time. I don't suggest anyone to do that ever. It was so bad. <laughs> like, like I almost died. But it's one of those memories of like, holy shit, that was so good because it sucked so hard. Um, yeah, and then being able to sort of identify those and laugh about them is pretty fucking important too. It's your best joke. Oh, Jesus, you don't want to hear my best one. Well, I do want to hear best one. Nah, no one wants to hear that sort of filth. My favourite, I actually got asked this other on a podcast and the guy didn't laugh. And because I, I, I think it might have been a bit of a dodgy Zoom connection, I was like, "This is fucking awkward." I reckon the one joke that just fucking killed me when I read it um, was, um, "Why do all Finnish Navy ships have a barcode on the side of them?" So when they come back into port, they can scan a Navy in. <laughs> it's fucking terrible. It was the best fucking dad joke ever. Because <laughs> I was like. Scandinavian, I'm like, Scandinavian, fuck, <laughs> like, kill me. Yeah, I, I, it's like my go-to dad joke. There's that in the, um, um, what's the difference between people from Dubai and Abu Dhabi? The people in Dubai don't like the Flintstones, but the people in Abu Dhabi do. <laughs> uh. The thing is, you've got to think of the more you think of it, the more stupid it is. You're like, fuck. It's <laughs> oh, a good one. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Um, all right. What about... If, what, Bella is a cat's name. Yeah. If Bella could talk, she could understand English, what would you say to her? What would be the first? What would thing? I say to her? What would be the? You got one chance to say something to your cat, a sentence, yeah. a paragraph, whatever, and she will understand it. After that, she's back to her cat. Oh, shit. What are you going to tell her? Go. Um. Like, thanks for growing up with me. Bella is twenty-two, twenty-three. She, I know, I is fucked. My mates are convinced that she died when I was young, and mum and dad the old swaparoo, because uh, they're like she can't be that old, but she. Unless mum and dad have done that and they haven't told me, she is. Um, she's like 22 or 23. Um, and she was a stray, not a feral cat, but stray, who just ended up uh, in our um, uh, bloody haystack at home as not even a kitten. She was like a grown cat, um, just, you know, left as a stray and, you know, just ended up staying. And now she's over here with me and she's that bloody old the Google cat calculator goes to 16. And I've done some maths and she's like 114 or something years old. Um, and although, you know, she's on her last legs, but, um, well, she's still going pretty well, to be honest, but amazingly. Um, 
it's like, holy shit, she's been there through so much shit. Like, she's seen me from a toddler to now. It's like, holy fuck, Bill's been around for everything. Um, yeah, so it'd be like a, a thank you for sort of being there growing up. Um, yeah, cats, are, cats are awesome. <laughs> I love cats. Um, we were talking before about cats that dogs just want to be your friend and they're always happy and everything. The best thing about cats is they're fucking pricks. Like, that's the best thing about them is because they're a prick, but then they need you so much. And we spoke about a friend who, he was the first one to put me on to this, he said, I love cats because they're exactly like me as a man. I'm such a fucking self, like, self-obsessed, like self ignorant prick to everyone. But then occasionally all I need is a cuddle and somewhere warm and I'm so soft. <laughs> and then I'm just into everyone because I'm, I don't need anyone else in my life. I'm this strong, hard dude like a cat. And then I just need comfort and warm and a cuddle. <laughs> and it put me onto I'm like, that is exactly a fucking cat. Oh, yeah, they're good fun. That's awesome. I reckon you're going to make some, possibly change some cat haters. I hope so. <laughs> People hit me up. Like, I literally just follow you for your cat. And I'm like, yeah, that's fair. Like, I have no problem with that at all. Uh, and I've had people being like, well, I have had people say, oh, I've adopted a cat because of you, you and Bella. And I'm like, well, that's pretty good. That's, that's bloody good work. <laughs> yeah, Bella's, um, Bella's good. She cruises around. <laughs> Funny you're changing the lives of cats as well. Yeah. Steak or kale? Steak every time. You know, you know me. I was on a carnivore all-meat diet for like five weeks and it was big it sucked in the beginning and at the end because it was like I'm so sick of eating meat. Um, but yeah, it's just experimenting. Like, here we go. I'm just going to eat meat for a month. Beer or whiskey? Uh, whiskey. Every time. Straight on uh, Straight on ice. What was it called? Uh, cold. As far as weather, cold. Um, I don't mind the heat. Cold's better. Cold environments, people rely on other people more and they're closer and nicer to each other. I think this, I've explained this, this is the difference between Finland and Australia. Australia, Finnish people, where I've had most of my experience, at least overseas, are significantly nicer to each other than Australians, yet have all the reason in the world not to be. Australia is the luckiest country on earth. And I put, I in myself, put all this down onto their weather, that it's... Well, when I was there, two hours of daylight a day, and it was about minus 40 every day. You die unless you help out your neighbours. Like, if I ask, well, maybe not you, but if I ask anyone, when was the last time you went over to your neighbour's place and you said, oh, hey, how are you going? You're right. You'd be like, never. We don't do that. Like, I don't even know my fucking neighbour's name. In Finland, every single day, maybe twice a day, they walk over to the neighbour's place, hey, are you going all right? Yeah, yeah, no worries. And they all live in, like, shared apartments so they can all share warmth between the houses. Um, it is illegal there not to stop for a car on the side of the road because the weather's so severe it could kill them. Um, and I think this communal sort of feeling and being there for each other, we have so much to live for because we have it almost so easy, really good economy, really good weather, that we lose that sort of sense of um, relying on each other and that um, really helps. And I think the cold is actually because of that. Plus, in Finland, everyone rugs up massively, goes to clubs and wears fuck all underneath, and it's wicked. Um, it's a weird place. If you're, going to, if you're going to Europe, go there. It's like, what the fuck? What the fuck is this? Like, it's fucking insane. 